Hello, everyone. Uh, we're about to get started, so please settle in. Welcome to our Interdisciplinary Instrumentation Colloquium. Today, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Morgan Burks. Morgan Burks is a physicist at Livermore National Laboratory. He specializes in instrumentation for gamma ray spectroscopy and gamma ray imaging. In particular, he has focused on mechanical cooling of germanium detectors for space and terrestrial applications. He helps to develop the first germanium spectrometer in deep space, which is onboard NASA's Mercury Messenger spacecraft. He led the development of Gemini, an ultra lightweight, low power germanium spectrometer for national security applications. Currently, he's working on instruments for three NASA deep space planetary missions to the asteroid belt, the moons of Mars, and Saturn's largest moon, Titan. And today we're gonna to hear about the Psyche mission. Testing, testing, can folks hear me okay? Good. So my name is Morgan Burks. I'm a physicist from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And today we're going to talk about the Psyche mission. This is NASA's mission to the asteroid belt to study a very unusual object called 16 Psyche. This mission launched in October of last year. And as we speak, it is traveling at over 20 kilometers per second towards Mars. It's going to Mars first, where it'll do a gravitational assist, which will slingshot it out to the asteroid belt. It has a high resolution gamma ray spectrometer on board, which was built by our group at Livermore Lab. And we have our first data from flight. And that uh, spectrometer is giving the highest resolution of any gamma ray spectrometer that's ever flown into space. So today I'm gonna to talk about the Psyche mission and some of the interesting science that we're going to do. I'll talk about our instrument and how it's going to contribute to the overall science goals, show some of our first flight data. And in case all of that is super boring, I have really cool photos of rockets that we can look at, so. Here is our team, it's myself, Gunbo Kim, and Nathan Hines, who is here with us today. And this is our, the heart of the spectrometer. Um, just before, we just finished testing and we're about to deliver it to our collaborators at Johns Hopkins, where they assemble um, what's called an anti-coincident shield and the flight electronics and some other components. And I'll be talking about the instrument later, but first I want to talk about the Psyche mission. So to put it into context, here is a graphic of every planetary body that has been visited by missions with gamma ray spectroscopy on board. And all the ones in yellow are the ones for which we have developed the uh, gamma ray spectrometer. And I'll just highlight a couple. Um, in the past, I've given talks about messenger over here. I don't have a laser pointer, but it's at uh, the planet Mercury. This was the first mission to go into orbit around Mercury. And our gamma ray spectrometer took the first ever gamma ray data of the planet. Um, we are also, we just delivered an instrument to the Japanese Space Agency, which is JAXA. And that is going to study Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars. And that mission is a landed mission. It's a sample return. It's actually gonna land on Phobos, take a sample and come back. And our gamma ray spectrometer will help figure out the elemental composition of Phobos and learn something about how it originated. We are also involved with NASA's Dragonfly mission way over here that's going to Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. We are building the gamma ray spectrometer for that. And in fact, uh, Nathan Hines um, did his PhD work helping me build and, and test the prototype for that. And we're now working on the flight instrument. So uh, I hope one day to come back and talk about these other missions. Um, but today I'm gonna to be talking about Psyche. So Psyche, 16 Psyche is an asteroid in the main asteroid belt. So the main asteroid belt is between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. There are other asteroids belt, the Kuiper belt. Uh, there are asteroids in the Lagrange points around Jupiter and so on, but this is the main asteroid belt. And Psyche was discovered in 1852, it's called 16 Psyche because uh, they number asteroids in the order that they were discovered. So it's the 16th asteroid ever discovered. 
It's about 200 kilometers in diameter, and it's called an M-class asteroid, M meaning metallic. And they think that it's composed largely of iron and nickel, which is very unusual. Most asteroids in the main asteroid belt are rocky. If you go out to the Kuiper belt, they're icy bodies. Metallic bodies are very rare. And so NASA is sending a mission to study this unusual object. It's a Discovery class mission. It launched in October of last year. It's going to take six years to get there, and that's even with the help of a gravitational assist around Mars. Uh, the principal investigator for the whole mission is Dr. Lindy Elkins tatton She's um, at Arizona State University. And the primary science question is, what is the nature of this unusual object? Basically, how do you get a 200-kilometer ball of iron and nickel floating around in the asteroid belt? So since we won the mission, it's been getting a lot more attention, and a lot of telescopes have actually looked uh, at this. So Alma looked at it and the millimeter band range and made shape models with fairly decent resolution. And they saw that its thermal inertia was consistent with a conductive surface, maybe metallic. Arecibo looked at it, uh, this is before it was damaged, and they also made shape models and estimated its density, They're about 4,500 um, kilograms per meter cube. And that's pretty high. Rocky bodies may be more like 3,000, 3,200, something like that. Um, and so some of the properties they measured were also consistent with a metallic body. Hubble took a look at it and measured its reflectance spectrum, which was consistent with an iron surface. And James Webb took a look at it in the micron range, which turns out was not very useful. They were looking for hydration. Nobody thought it would be high, that they'd have hydrated minerals on it on Psyche, so they confirmed that there's not. So it wasn't especially useful, but that's uh, still interesting. So the spacecraft is going to have a suite of uh, instruments on board because there's only so much you can do from Earth-based observations. So we're going to go to Psyche, go into orbit, and study it more directly. It'll have our gamma-ray spectrometer, and we're going to look at a suite of elements, and I'll tell you kind of how gamma-ray spectroscopy works in space. But the two elements we care about most are iron and nickel, because we think it's a metallic body. And that'll come up again. Also has a neutron spectrometer, actually a couple, where we get fast and thermal and epithermal neutrons. Have a magnetometer to see if there's a remnant magnetic field in this body. It'll have a multispectral imager, which is just a high-resolution CCD camera with a bunch of filters that allow you to select throughout the visible and IR ranges to look for particular minerals. And then it has something called radio science, which is a pretty amazing technique where they use the radio communication. So they send the signal with very precise timing and they use the Doppler shift of that time uh -huh. to look for perturbations um, in, uh, in the timing. And from that, they can actually map the gravitational field of this body that you're orbiting. So they look at the perturbations in the timing signal and they can map it. And that's important because Psyche is not a spherical body. It's a kind of potato shape. It's going to have very inhomogeneous gravitational field. And so it's hard to find a stable orbit. So you have to start with a really far orbit, map the gravitational field, come in a little bit closer, map it to higher fidelity, and so on to make sure you're always in a stable orbit. Okay, so let's talk about what this body could be. And the story begins with the early solar system where you had the early dust and material that was forming. And you have material called chondritic material. It's like the early rock and dust of the solar system. And, you know, in the solar system, it kind of clumps together gravitationally and, and you get little pieces and eventually maybe you get bigger pieces. And eventually, if you get enough, just from gravity, it starts to compress itself into a sphere. And from the gravitational pressure, plus the early hot um, radioactivity, a lot of short-lived radioisotopes in the early solar system, heat up the center of this body. And it gets hot enough, 
it can melt the center of this body. The heat can't escape well because all this rock. And it can actually melt uh, the inside. And it drives the heavier elements, such as iron and nickel, to the inside. And the lighter silicates tend to float to the outside. So the oxygen, magnesium, aluminum, so on, things we think of that make up the crust. And so this is what happened to the Earth. So the Earth is a differentiated planet where we have an iron nickel core. We have this rocky outer crust. And so this is a process called planetary differentiation. And what we think may have happened is that Psyche would have been part of this early differentiated small planet uh, called a planetesimal. And it would have been hit with some other massive object that blew apart the mantle and crust, leaving only this iron and nickel core intact. So just like the Earth has an iron nickel core, we think this body did, and maybe the, the you know, mantle and crust got blown away. And so if that's the case, then this is the only place in the solar system that we know of where you can go and directly study a planetary core. And so, I mean, we have a core in, in Earth, but you know, it's 4,000 miles of magma and so on. It's going to be hard to get there. So it's a unique opportunity to learn about planetary formation, not only for other solar system bodies, but also uh, for our own. And I mentioned that our spectrometer, our, we want to look at a lot of elements, but primarily iron and nickel. And the reason is, if this is indeed an iron core, um, when this was a molten body, it would have been primarily iron and nickel. And as it begins to cool and solidify, it can solidify from the outside in or the inside out. And the nickel has a preference for the liquid phase. So that means it's either going to drive the nickel to the, out, um, to the outer surface or drive it into the core. So when I talk about our instrument and the spectroscopy we do, we're going to measure the elemental composition of the surface. And if we see a high percentage of nickel compared to iron, that means it's solidified from the inside out or vice versa. So it'll help us say something about how this body formed. Oh, I had one other thing. Um, it's also possible that during this impact, um, it just made this rubble pile, you know, a whole bunch of pieces, and then gravitationally they may have coalesced over time. And then in that case, we might see a very inhomogeneous ratio of iron to nickel, for example. So how does gamma ray spectroscopy work in space? Um, I, this is Berkeley Lab. I'm sure a lot of people know about spectroscopy. Are very many people familiar with gamma ray spectroscopy for terrestrial applications? Yeah, a handful of people. In space, it's a little bit different. Um, in space, any planetary body, unless it has a thick atmosphere like Earth, is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are high, primarily high-energy protons up to GeV range. They can also be alphas and maybe some small ions, but primarily protons. And they bombard the surface of your planetary body, and they undergo spallation, where they knock into atoms, break them apart, and you get the liberation of a bunch of fast neutrons. And those neutrons interact in the surface through inelastic scattering. Eventually, they'll do thermal capture, and you get um, the release of gamma rays. And so these gamma rays are characteristic of the elemental composition of the surface. So if you have a spectrometer either in orbit or landed, and we have missions doing both, then you can determine the elemental composition of your body. So in all these planetary missions where we're building gamma ray spectrometers, it's always determined the elemental composition. And then um, scientists use that to infer about the evolution and formation of your body. Oh. But like Earth, you can also have in these bodies naturally occurring radioactivity. So potassium, uranium, and thorium in their daughters. So you can also measure those. And you do see those on planetary bodies, just like you see on Earth. So here's our gamma ray spectrometer. I showed you in the early picture, just the heart of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is with all the components getting ready to be delivered to the uh, spacecraft. So it has our, our spectrometer cryostat is kind of, you can see this gold part, and it's inserted into something called an anti-coincident shield. 
That's just a, a borated plastic scintillator that we use to trigger whenever a cosmic ray comes through. That way we can differentiate the cosmic ray and know it's, uh, we can clean up our gamma ray spectrum. We can, we can veto those. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, a germanium detector, uh, the advantage is it gives you very high resolution, um, but the cost is you have to cryogenically cool it. I'm gonna talk more about this in a second. But, so we have to have a, a cryo cooler on board. That takes power. Um, that power produces heat. On a spacecraft, the only way to get rid of heat is to radiate it. So we have radiators on board and we have to radiate to cold space. Um, then we have the electronics. Um, this is a photomultiplier photo multiplier for reading out our, our scintillator. Oh, let's see what I want to point out here. Um, our energy range is up to about 10 MeV. That's kind of adjustable. Uh, we get excellent energy resolution. Um, and it's relatively low mass and, and low power, which is important for uh, deep space instruments. So this is what a germanium crystal looks like. This is the heart of our detector. It's just a cylinder of a very pure germanium. And when a gamma ray interacts in this germanium, so we've configured it to act like a semiconductor diode. And we have about 1,000 volts. Actually, for space instrumentation, uh, we actually go up to about 3,000 volts for a space instrument. And when a gamma ray interacts, it just releases electrons and holes. And we collect those on charge sensitive preamplifiers. And it turns out that the number of charges that you collect is directly proportional to the energy of the gamma ray. So you measure the charges. Now you know the energy of your gamma ray. You know the energy is characteristic of the element that released it, whether it's magnesium or oxygen and so on, technically of the isotope. But uh, usually we're not doing isotopic analysis for planetary science. We're just doing elemental analysis. We usually don't have the sensitivity to get isotopic information, although this, uh, this mission may be the exception to that. And so the advantage of germanium, this is actually two gamma ray spectra. If you haven't seen a gamma ray spectrum, maybe many of you have, but if you haven't, here's two. The one in black is from our mission that we sent to Mercury. And the one in red was one that our collaborator, collaborators sent to the moon. And they had a lower resolution scintillator detector. And the difference is in the gamma ray spectrum, each one of these peak corresponds to a particular element, technically an isotope. And if you have high resolution, you can differentiate those peaks and you can really get good elemental sensitivity and selectivity. If you have res low resolution, it tends to blur them together. So that's the reason you want to fly germanium uh, is to get that elemental selectivity and sensitivity. But you have to cryogenically cool, and so there's a lot of engineering challenges associated with that. So I showed you the instrument uh, a couple slides back just before we delivered it to the, the spacecraft. Here we are integrating it onto the spacecraft. I'm standing in the back. I'm, I'm tall. I'm not that tall. Uh, I'm standing on a little platform so that I can reach and point to the, our gamma ray spectrometer, which is on this boom sticking out from the spacecraft. And the reason we're on a boom is because the spacecraft itself is going to be lit up by cosmic rays. It's going to be activated and so on. And that produces background force. So we're on a two meter boom and that helps reduce this background a little bit. We would have liked to be on a much longer boom to get farther away, but as you'll see, we were limited on how much space we had in the rocket. So uh, here is the spacecraft um, getting ready to go into the fairing. On the sides, you see the, the solar panels and I think I have a picture I'm going to show. This is artistic rendering. When the solar panels are extended, you see it's huge. And um, you obviously can't launch like that. So for launch, they have to have the solar panels all folded up on the sides. And I also want to point out here, these two red circles. Um, this spacecraft is the first one to demonstrate outside of Earth orbit what are called ion thrusters. Technically, they're Hall effect thrusters. They're a type of solar electric propulsion. And I have another slide. I'll show more on that in a second. And then over here at the top, you see that cylinder. That is called the deep space optical communication. So all spacecraft communicate via radio. 
And the problem is when you're in deep space, your radio signal just gets weaker and weaker and weaker and it limits your bandwidth. So for deep space missions, your bandwidth is actually very low, kilobytes kind of. And so for example, if you're at Mars, you can't send video. You don't have the bandwidth to send video. And so they are testing as part of this mission using a laser to uh, communicate. And so you get much higher bandwidth. The challenge is your pointing accuracy of a laser is in, you know, incredibly precise. You're out um, you know, hundreds of millions of miles away and you have to hit Earth. And of course, Earth is not where you see it. You, know, you have a telescope, it's not there because of speed of light and all kinds of um, relativity effects. And so there's a lot of challenges with it. But um, as you'll see, when we were testing our instrument during the day in cruise, they were testing this at night and they have it working and they actually were able to transfer back and forth. So one day, what that means is we may eventually have video from Mars, which would be pretty cool. This is the ion thruster. So basically, um, instead of normal like hydrazine rocket fuel, this uses uh, about a metric ton of krypton. No, I'm sorry, xenon. You can use krypton. We're using xenon. And it just ionizes the xenon and shoots it out um, at incredibly high velocities. And that's what gives us our thrust. And the advantage compared to normal rocket fuel is it's way, way, way more energy efficient. We can get a lot more for a, um, for a metric ton of fuel. We can get a lot more out of it. The disadvantage is the thrust is incredibly small, about 0 0.1 newtons. That's how much thrust we get but we're thrusting for six years, and it turns out it's enough to get us out to the asteroid belt. So here's another view of the spacecraft. You can see these ion thrusters right here. They're not very big, maybe something like that. And you, these red tanks there, those are the, Z, uh, the xenon tanks. And so they have about a metric ton of xenon um, in there. And then you can see just a ton of cabling. Our spectrometer is way at the top. They have all these red boxes here are, I think they're called thermal louvers. They're just part of keeping the thermal balance on the spacecraft. And yeah, tons of instrumentation. There's star trackers, there's a magnetometer, neutron detectors, lots and lots of stuff. Here's the spacecraft in uh, the fairing. So this is the fairing, the nose cone of the rocket. And uh, this is just before, so they folded up the solar panels package everything up, put it in this nose cone, and then this is going to get integrated onto the rocket. And so this is the rocket. This is a SpaceX Falcon Heavy. And they bring the whole thing out. You see the nose cone in the front. So that's where our spacecraft is. And they bring this whole thing out on a gantry, traveling about one mile per hour, something like that, out to the launch pad. And then they stand the whole thing up. And a couple things to notice here. Uh, so the fairings at the top, that's where the spacecraft is. They have the main boost. If you know something about the, the SpaceX rockets, this single uh, rocket is what they call the Falcon 9, I believe. And when they add the side boosters, they call it the Falcon Heavy. So basically you have the main rocket and you have these side boosters. And that's because we need a big boost. We need a big head start to get out to the asteroid belt. You know, we don't have a lot of thrust on our spacecraft. So we really needed a big, uh, a big launch. This is our view. Um, so we went out for the launch. Um, we're about three to four miles away. This is the famous pad 39A. Has anyone been to Kennedy Space Center? Anyone here who's been? Is anyone else? It's pretty cool. Uh, this is, you know, Cape Cavern Canaveral, Florida. This is the famous pad where the Apollo missions launched. So sending uh, astronauts to the moon. And you have to be about three or four miles away just for safety if something were to go wrong. Um, you want to be clear. And, oh yeah. So here's just a map. You can see... Right up here is 39A, it says SpaceX, that's where we launched from. And then we were over here, across the lake at the Apollo uh, Center. And so, 
This dramatic, stunning photo is of the launch. And a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, one, notice how cloudy it is. Uh, there were thunderstorms all week, and we had already scrubbed two launches and missed because of the storms. And we weren't sure it was going to launch this day. And I'd already been there for a while, and I was going to have to fly back that night. And so I thought I was going to miss the launch, uh, you know, after working for years on this instrument. Um, but we go to the observation area, and where everybody's watching the weather. And um, the second thing you'll notice is, I don't think you can tell, maybe a little bit it's too dark but there's um, condensation around the spacecraft. So what happens is about an hour before launch, they fill the tanks with the liquid oxygen. And that's cryogenic liquid. And they don't do that unless they're pretty sure that they're gonna launch, because it's wasteful. If they have to scrub a launch and they've already filled these huge tanks with this cryogenic, uh, it's very wasteful. So we knew about an hour before when they started filling that they were pretty sure they were gonna launch. And so now, if you'll be patient, I'm going to try to share something with you. Oops. Just one second here. All right, and can they see that online? I don't know if anybody's watching here soon. Hopefully this is gonna work. Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Obviously, this is a big moment. So it goes up, and then it starts to tip over. Like, it's heading to orbit. And then, in a little bit, I think it's after this video. It, um, I have binoculars, so I can see this. You won't see this in the video. Um, once the side boosters are depleted, they're going to break off. And they have just enough fuel that they're going to come down and they're actually going to land in a pad in the down range of it. So we were able to watch the boosters come down and land. You actually heard the sonic boom as they re-entered, and then you can see them. There's a distance to see them land. Um, okay, so let me switch back here. back well let's see there we go okay so obviously that was super cool that was fun um but let's talk about oh i got okay i got a couple more slides and we'll get into the science stuff um so this just shows the progression of what's happening so it launches it goes through something called max q which is the maximum force that the the rocket's going to experience through acceleration and atmospheric drag. And usually if it survives max Q, then you then it's usually it's good. Then the side boosters break off, then MECO, the main engine cutoff, and then you get the second stage coming out. Then the fairing, that nose cone breaks off, leaving our spacecraft exposed, and eventually our spacecraft um, is ejected. Here is the second stage. So the first stage has ejected. And so we have the second stage here. Um, as we're getting ready to go into a parking orbit before the final boost into uh, leaving Earth's gravity. So the launch happened in October. And uh, there's this very circuitous path to get out to the asteroid belt. You, you can never just go directly to something. You always have to kind of spiral your way out. And um, about two months in, we did something called initial checkout. That's where all the instruments got to turn on for the first time. 
And I'm going to talk about that. Then we are headed now on our way towards a gravitational assist around Mars, and that'll give us a big boost. And then we'll head out to the asteroid belt and eventually meet up with Psyche. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you guys on the spot and ask a question. This is um, an update of where our spacecraft is. As of yesterday, I made this, uh, put this together yesterday. It is just about two AU from Earth. Um, oh, there's a, something in the way that you can't see it. And we're traveling just over 20 kilometers per second. Um, let me ask a question. How do you know where your spacecraft is? Anybody want to venture a guess? No pressure. Hollman filters. Pardon? I heard something. Hollman filters. Some kind of filters. Can, did someone hear that? I don't, I'm not sure. It, it's, it's, oh. a, it's a snarky answer. It's the way to capture limited information based on your modeling. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, all right. Well, it turns out it's hard, so I'm going to tell you how. I mean, to my limited knowledge, they don't, they don't ask me to do that. So, um, so one thing is easy. You can get the orientation of your spacecraft by star filters or, you know, star trackers. That's really easy. You can do that with high precision, right? Every spacecraft has star trackers. But now how do you know where you are? Well, I mentioned the radio signal earlier. So we can get very precise timing information. So we can know where we are on a vector not a vector, a distance. We can know the distance, the timing to our spacecraft with exceptional precision. But where do we know this way? It turns out it's really hard. In a typical spacecraft, which is with normal rocket fuel, they'll typically just do a burn, and then everything's just ballistic trajectory, just ballistic. So you're just going in a gravitational field of some multi-body you know, planetary system. We have the added complication that not only do we have the ballistics, but we have this continual thrust all the time with our ion thruster. So we're thrusting and doing ballistics. And so basically it's forward modeling. They're just having to model and figure out where the spacecraft is all the time. And so it's a very tricky problem. And this is the first deep space mission where they've ever had to do that. Uh, so we saw a lecture from the team on how they do it. And it's just crazy mathematics. Even for a bunch of PhDs who do mathematics, it was crazy mathematics. But uh, I thought that was very cool. So they tell us every day where our spacecraft is. OK, so initial checkout is the first time we got to turn on our instrument in space. Our particular detector, we only get to turn on every six months um, because our cryo cooler has a limited lifetime. Other instruments are running continuously. Um, so to turn it on is a big deal. You'll see we had to develop all our procedures. All the commanding had been developed months, if not years, ahead of time. Um, you know, Every command that you give is first rehearsed on what's called an engineering model. So we have a, a nearly identical model on Earth. And we run everything through that first to make sure we don't screw anything up. Um, and then for the actual test, we went to Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena to the main control room. If you ever watch on TV when they do the, the Mars landings, uh, this is the control room where that happens. You'll notice in the back all these radio dishes. That's telling you all the spacecraft they're currently talking to, whether uplink or downlink. Um, and then you got all the different subsystems. So basically, they're talking to the Deep Space Network. And then this is the room uh, where actually you do the control. And so this is me and some of our team and collaborators. And when we're actually doing the, um, when we're actually commanding to the spacecraft, all the different subsystems have representatives there. So from thermal and communications and everything. And so everybody's kind of monitoring all the time to make sure everything's working well, especially the first time when you're turning it on. It's a lot of scrutiny. And this is it. This is our first gamma ray spectrum from space. Um, if you're not a gamma ray spectroscopist, it doesn't look like much. But to us, this is the culmination of almost 10 years of work. And 
Um, what we see are about 80 gamma ray peaks. I highlighted just a couple. I'm going to go into a little more detail. And something I want to point out is we actually see two spectra here, this blue and the orange one. And the blue one is just our raw data as it comes in. And then the orange is what we call the anti-coincident spectrum. This is the one where our anti-coincident shield has vetoed out the, the cosmic rays. And so you see you get a much lower background because you, you can see there's about a factor of 10 at high energies, lots and lots of cosmic rays constantly bombarding your instrument, and it just degrades your signal to noise. So if you veto those out, you just improve your signal. So we use the, the anti-coincident spectrum is very useful. And so the way the anti-coincident shield works is in red, we have our germanium detector. That's the heart of our spectrometer. And this blue is the anti-coincident shield. And I think the next graphic shows, yeah. So here's a zoom of that. And when the cosmic ray comes through, high energy protons, uh, GEV protons go right through the, the instrument and they trigger both the germanium detector and the anti-coincident shield. So you get a time coincidence, and then you just, you know you can veto that event. So that's how we get rid of a lot. But it actually gives us a lot of information. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the spectra. So here I've normalized the anti-coincident spectrum, the orange spectrum, so that they have the same baseline, so you can compare the peaks. And so this is one region of our spectrum and it turns out there's a lot of physics that we can tell already. So even though we're just in deep space, we're years away from our target, there's a lot we can learn about our performance and the background and the radiation and background of our spacecraft. Remember, I said we we're on a boom to reduce how much background we get from the spacecraft, but we're going to get some, and we get some from our instrument itself. It gets activated. So there's, there's a lot of physics going on here. Um, over here, you see copper line, and that's just an inelastic scatter. So a neutron um, inelastic scatter off copper, and then that gives you a characteristic gamma ray. And we see magnesium. We don't have any magnesium uh, in our design. So magnesium is a spallation product from aluminum. So our cryostat's made of aluminum. We have lots of that. Uh, sometimes a proton comes in, breaks apart an aluminum atom, and you get this magnesium line. Oh, we do have copper, by the way. We have copper cold strap for our, our cooling path. Then you see thorium. So thorium is a natural decay. If anybody's ever done like low background spectroscopy, low background counting, um, you really want to reduce any kind of impurities. Uh, we did not focus on that so much. It wasn't so necessary. So we see a little bit of thorium and uranium. Also at MEV lines, there's uranium. We see some of these natural radioactive products probably in our electronics, the rare earth elements of our electronic components. Um, we also see, this is from gallium, it's really from our germanium detector. So this is a product from our germanium detector, spallation in our detector directly gives this prompt line. See inelastic scattering off aluminum. And then one more detail I'll show, this is really just for people who care a lot about uh, gamma ray spectroscopy, but notice that some of these peaks match up. The orange and blue are the same amplitude, and some are very different. That actually is very revealing. And I think this is the first time in the planetary science context that anyone has been able to do this kind of analysis, something I've been in looking into quite a lot. But the fact that this peak is the same, that means it's not being vetoed. That peak is not being vetoed by the anti-coincident shield. And whereas this one is, and so what that means is it tells you something about the mechanism, whether it's a prompt interaction or delayed activation, whether it's spallation, inelastic scatter. You can use this ratio to tell you something about what kind of physics, because sometimes it's ambiguous. So for example, this peak right here, um, if you look at the, the National Nuclear Data Center from Brookhaven, it'll tell you that at that energy, it could be 48 vanadium or it could be 48 titanium, for example. Well, we know we have titanium in our, in our system. It's uh, part of the mounting bracket. But the fact that you see this partial veto suggests that it is, in fact, titanium, not 48 vanadium. 
And so in previous space missions, they saw this line and they weren't sure. It was just ambiguous. But we can identify that because 48 vanadium has a 12-day half-life. It's a long-lived activation product. So it's going to decay 12 days after the, the cosmic ray went through. So no coincidence is going to happen. So it's a small detail, but it's um, allowing us to really understand the nuances of what's happening on our spacecraft, such that when we do get to Psyche, um, we'll have a better uh, idea of our sensitivity and we'll be able to better figure out what's going on there. So this just kind of summarizes what I was just saying. There's a, a lot of different things we can tell from this gamma ray spectroscopy. So we can look at the inelastic scatter lines and we can tell you about the materials, you know, that we're being, uh, that are affecting us. So we know our aluminum cryostat, the titanium bracket, the copper, the germanium detector. We can see all that. We can see spallation. Um, we can see gamma rays that come specifically from the plastic scintillator. Those are characteristic. We can identify those. We see pair production from oxygen. Uh, we think the photomultiplier tube has a little bit of oxygen in the glass. Um, and so on. And so there's a lot of physics we see. Um, something that we don't see, if you know about neutron interactions all, we don't see very much neutron thermal capture which is surprising because our plastic scintillator, the anti-coincidence shield, has a lot of hydrogen in it. And hydrogen is very good at thermalizing neutrons. But it turns out we have a borated plastic scintillator and the boron just eats up all those, uh, those neutrons, the thermal neutrons. It has a cross-section of 767 barns, so thousands of times higher than hydrogen. So it just eats up uh, any, any thermal uh, capture. So we do see the boron capture line, but that's it. We don't see capture from anything else. I think this is the last science slide, uh, actually almost done. Um, the, as I mentioned, iron and nickel are the elements we care the most about. So one of the things we wanted to make sure is that in crews, that we don't have an iron and nickel background because that will interfere with our sensitivity. So as part of developing the spacecraft, we try to impose on the rest of the mission really to everybody to minimize the iron and nickel, you know, and you do the best. You can't completely er eliminate it, but you do the best you can. And so a lot of effort was done to minimize. So, and then we wanted to verify. And so it turns out that iron 56 does have some background. Now, this is a characteristic gamma ray line that we're depending on at Psyche to measure the iron. And there is some intrinsic background at that line. And, um, Turns out the count rate is low. It's a fractions of a count per minute. So it's unlikely to affect us if we have significant iron at, at Psyche, but it does inform our sensitivity. Fortunately, iron has another isotope, uh, iron 54, and we have previously demonstrated in the lab that we should be able to, at Psyche, measure gamma rays from iron 54. And you see there, there's no background at iron 54. So, that means it's a good potential alternative signature. I have a paper that just came out that really goes into detail about using iron 54, which has never been used before in a planetary science context to measure iron. People have measured iron 56 often. So this may be the first isotopic analysis from gamma rays done in a planetary science um, context. And we also looked at our main line from nickel and you see nickel um, there's a close line at potassium. So this is a 1460 potassium line, but our nickel line, we can clearly resolve and you see there's no background there. So that bodes well. Yeah, so this is, I was just, I was basically just scaling it to, to show the peaks, but um, yeah, it's just for visual effect. Yeah, it wasn't part of the analysis. Okay, I think this is my last slide. When the second stage deployed, the final thing it does is it um, ejects the spacecraft. So the fairing has blown off. And so this is the final view. This is the last photo we had of our spacecraft as it uh, moves off towards the, in this case, it's going towards Mars, away from the rocket. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions.
All right. Um, so you were saying that um, the way that they uh, tell where the the uh, satellite, the spacecraft is, is by forward modeling. But um, do they do they have a way of like a, like a feedback way of checking that they're they're actually getting it right or? How do they do that? This is a topic which I only know a little bit about, so I won't be able to answer in detail. But as you get, let's say when you do a Mars flyby, you're going to get a lot of information from close to Mars because your trajectory is changing a lot. When you're just in cruise, I don't think there's a lot of uh, feedback, but that's, you know, definitely that was not my uh, area of expertise. So, yeah, but super interesting topic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you said you turn it on every six months. What is the total number of hours you can operate or you expect? And what kind of safety margin do you put on that? That um, we actually have a huge safety margin. We could, we, it's going to take six years to get there. We couldn't operate for six years, but we could operate for several years. So we, op we were turned on for two weeks for this first measurement. And so we think we're, you know, in total, we might be on for a couple months during the whole mission in total, but we think we could operate for years, so we should have a big margin. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned about like uh, to use the gamma ray uh, spe special scopy um, to measure the element. Uh, essentially, you should use uh, the Lucian capture um, like uh, there. But I mean, how deep? Um, you can deduce the like mm. uh, material, right? I mean, can you can you do ten meter? Can you ten twenty Good meter? Good question. Like, ten away in the yeah. So the question was, we're measuring gamma rays from the surface, but how deep can you measure? So the gamma rays of energies that we look at are pretty. You're looking pretty much at the surface, maybe tens of centimeters, maybe ten twenty centimeters, something like depending on the energy, and so you're really getting just the surface. And for people who know, if you know something about planetary you know, interactions, um, a lot of planetary surfaces, such as the moon, have this regolith on top. Basically, there's a dust that's been piled up over you know, millions of years of bombardment with asteroids. So sometimes you're having to try to peer through the regolith. We don't know if Psyche will have a, a thick regolith or not. But yeah, we typically see just the top few tens of centimeters. Hi. Um, I was just curious if you have a if you know what the sort of how hostile the um, deep space radiation in, environment is like relative to Leo. Like, are you expecting degradation of your resolution, your germanium detector, from the six years of accumulated getting blasted by cosmic rays? Yeah. So we think a lot about that. In fact, Nathan, our colleague, did his dissertation on radiation damage during cruise. You know, the six year, in this case, going out to Titan. Um, the, the, space, the space environment is pretty mild. Um, you're asking about LEO, so it depends. If you're in LEO, LEO's low Earth orbit, where most satellites are, um, that's also pretty mild. But if you get a little bit higher into the Van Allen belts, it gets really harsh, really fast, like exponentially worse, really fast. And so we are nothing like that. But we maybe are comparable to just a normal LEO um, orbit. We have an online question from Daniel and then Spencer. But Daniel, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I had a question. Um, as someone who knows very little about spacecraft design, I was curious, is there a, a driving reason why an extending boom could not be used to move your detector further from your craft after you launch? Yeah, some people have done that. They have, he's asking, can you extend our detector farther, like a boom? Is that what you're asking? Like a, a boom that kind of, uh, yeah, extends yes. out? They did that on a mission that went to Mars called Mars Odyssey. They did have a extending boom. It's mainly a expense and complexity and a risk trade-off. So when you make such a complex boom, you're, you're taking a risk that something doesn't work correctly. Um, and so we had sufficient sensitivity so, for what we're trying to do. So we had a hard time justifying the extra expense and complexity for it. We would have preferred it, but it was a trade-off. Spencer, online, go ahead. 
Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, so you're building something that will have to work for a very, very long time, far away from where any engineers can get to it. Um, can you say something about how you design for reliability? Um, you know, predict, is there anything special about the germanium itself? Um, you know, and how do you sort of scale? It's obviously hard enough to build anything that's rugged enough for space and survive launch, but is there extra scaling to allow for the fact that this thing will need to survive for a decade? <laughs> So you've actually asked the question near and dear to my heart that uh, I would give a whole talk on just the instrumentation and the engineering challenges and I'd go in for hours and you guys would all get bored and leave. But that's what we spent the last, you know, almost 10 years worrying about for all these instruments is how do you build something that can go a billion miles and still work? And so uh, that's a really, you know, very in-depth question. I'll try to give a, a, a smaller answer. But um, some of the biggest factors are, are thermal, vibration, and radiation damage, right? Those are really the big ones. Um, for thermal design, we have a lot of experience because we sent a detector to Mercury. The surface of Mercury gets up to 400 degrees Celsius. You're right there by the sun. The sun is equivalent to 11 suns as seen by Earth. Uh, so the thermal design was very challenging, but we learned a lot from that that we can incorporate in our current designs. So our current designs, Thermally, we kind of, they're easy now for us, uh, especially when you go into the outer solar system, it's cooler. Uh, mechanical, um, yeah, you have to survive rocket launch. It's a rough, it's rough. And our first design uh, that I came up with, we have a vibration facility and we went to the Vibe facility and everybody's speculating, is it going to work? Is it not? I'm like, of course it's going to work. It's going to be fine. And I ended up that day taking it home in a box in little pieces. <laughs> it did not survive the first uh, iteration. So uh, you have to iterate. We did you know, CAD modeling to figure out what the resonance modes were. And we figured out there was a rocking mode we hadn't accounted for and we had to redesign for that. Um, and then the third is radiation damage. So you do take a lot of radiation damage in space. When we sent our detector to Mercury, it took a lot of radiation damage. It's close to the sun. If you have a solar flare, you get really blasted. Um, but we learned a lot from that. And so we're much better now at designing for radiation damage. And there's a process called annealing where you can actually repair the damage in process. It's simple. You just heat up the crystal to a certain temperature and, and so on. Uh, there's some tricks and details always, but that's the basic idea. So those were the big things. But I think there's more like a philosophical question, which is there's so many details and so many unknowns and so many challenges that our design philosophy is really to go for simplicity. And that's a challenge because, you know, scientists and engineers, we want to make something fancy. But when you're really thinking about robustness, we have to fight, fight, fight to get all the functionality in the simplest design that you can. And so that's just a big ongoing battle. What trade-offs do you make, you know, for extra features or to make something more robust? So it's a constant challenge. For this mission. Thanks. How much of the technology was reused from existing things and how much did you kind of have to invent in the course of this to be able to do the instrumentation? Yeah, so uh, you saw in that er that one of the, the, um, the solar system map early on where I showed all the instruments. I didn't really talk about TGRS and RESI. So that's the transient gamma ray spectrometer. And RESI was a detector built by Space Sciences Lab just up the hill many years ago. We did those, those were both Earth orbit. And we learned a lot from those missions. And every instrument is just building on the one before. So we're constantly making improvements. Oh, the radiation damage, you know, we didn't handle it right. We learned about that, you know, vibration, thermal, and so on. So it's really, um, over the years, just getting better with each one. OK, so our last question comes from our greatness student interns. Mm -hmm. They read your recent paper for their journal club. And they were oh. curious what exactly happened with the iron activation on the messenger mission. Ah, okay. Wow, someone read my paper. That's the first one. That's awesome. Um, so when we sent the detector to Mercury, we were also interested in measuring iron. Um, there, there's a bunch of elements you wanted to measure on Mercury, but that was one of them. And about halfway into our measurement, about six months into it, we got hit with a huge solar event from the sun. 
and it activated all the iron on the surface and all the iron on the spacecraft. And suddenly our iron signal was flooded with this activation line, completely preventing our ability to measure iron for the remainder of the mission. Fortunately, there's a lot of other elements we were interested in, so it didn't, you know, didn't stop us, but it prevented us from mapping iron further. So at Psyche, iron is the main element we care about, iron and nickel. If the same thing happens to us, we're, that's a you know, big impact to the mission. And so what happens is eventually that signal will decay, but it takes months and months and months. And that's often not practical in, you know, during your mission. So the whole paper was looking at iron 54, this other isotope of iron, showing that we would be sensitive to measuring gamma rays from iron 54 and showing that they're not, we did measurements and you know, simulations to show that that line does not get activated significantly during a solar event. It does get activated, but the half-life is like 17 hours. So you wait a couple of days and then you're good to go. So that was kind of the subject of that. So thanks for giving me the plug, <laughs> yeah, for that. Thank you everyone for your excellent questions. Uh, Morgan is here all day, so please reach out to me if you would like to speak with him later. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks everybody.